Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Bradley Thompson here, and we are back with another episode of the Living the Canadian Dream podcast. Today, we have a very special guest across the sea right now in another continent. We had some Skype troubles, but we're here. We are virtually here. And um, today I have Jordan Bishop joining me with this podcast. Jordan, welcome. Hey, thanks a lot, Bradley. Thank you so much for coming on. I apologize for the Skype issues. Skype is annoying sometimes and it seems every time i do a podcast that is over skype i do have some sort of issue but usually we figure it out and today it just doesn't want to work so sorry about that <laughs> no worries awesome so thank you so much for coming on um this is very exciting i haven't seen you in years we met back at laurier long long time ago and mm -hmm. it's been a very long time what's new how's life I mean that that's a pretty <laughs> good question. For I I I mean if I do a little bit of quick math here, we're probably stretching back seven full years, uh, possibly a little more actually. Yeah. So yeah, I mean a lot has gone down. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm living overseas now. I've been overseas since leaving Laurier actually. Um, sure. Was living in a lot of different places around Asia, South America, Europe. Uh, right now I live in Istanbul in Turkey. Um, and yeah, things are going pretty well. Very cool. Awesome. So when we met, I think we met doing a dance class. I think that was when it was, um, I think mm -hmm. it was Kang's dance class, which was a very long time ago. And I remember when you were sort of like starting one of your first projects and I sort of have followed you along sort of virtually stalking, um, your projects along the way, which was one of the first one was your oyster, right? Yes. Yeah. And I was really fascinated about that behind the scenes because I actually followed it. I looked at all the, the blog posts and stuff like that, and it was very interesting stuff. Um, so can you tell everybody a little bit about your oyster? Yeah, absolutely. So the business has changed quite a bit since it started. You know, the, I launched that in, uh, in the middle of 2014. And at that yeah. time, it was a site designed to help Canadians get cheaper flights. And sure. I, I should preface this by saying that I actually didn't intend to start that business. It was a complete accident. Uh, it, it came out of a Facebook post that was really just intended for a couple of friends to see. Uh, but because that post went viral, uh, and when I say viral, I mean, you know, the term your oyster was trending on Twitter for all of Canada within 48 hours of me posting that. So that, that's, that's the sort so of crazy. Wow. It, it, it was a very crazy and unexpected time for sure. Um, so I, you know, I'm not exaggerating when I say that I fell into the business. Um, so at that point, I was helping Canadians to fly more cheaply. Um, you know, I've got a lot of tip or not like tricks and kind of hacks to figure out how to get cheaper flights. Uh, but over time, it's morphed into a personal finance site. And our goal right now, as it is in the start of 2020, is to become the largest and most reliable source of personal finance information for Canadians. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Can you sort of break down some of the stuff that was on that site initially? Yeah, certainly. Basically, how it launched was, you know, I, I realized... I'm a frequent traveler, and so I was wondering how can I save money on flights, because flights can be pretty expensive, especially if you're going around the world. So I started doing some digging around. I found a couple of strategies that seemed to make a lot of sense to me, but no one seemed to be talking about. So I thought, okay, if I'm you know, putting in 10 or 20 of hours of research here, and I'm only just getting to this, how many other people are out there that could use this really valuable information, but don't know about it because they haven't yeah. done dozens of hours of research. So yeah. I thought I'll help those people find this information. I'm just going to give it to them. Yeah. And that was, you know, that's the post that I'm talking about that went really viral and, and got a lot of attention. But yeah, you know, at the very core, all it was was a blog, a, an information site to help people use credit card points to smartly and very cheaply get uh, flights around the world. I love it. I love it. Yes. And that's sort of what caught my attention. And it actually taught me a lot. And I'm not just saying this because you're on the podcast. I'm saying this because it actually taught me a lot about the whole credit card thing and the rewards points. 
And then I kind of got into it. And I'm just like, this is a very interesting approach because I never even thought about the bonus points and stuff like that that you talk about. Can you talk a little bit about like, what's the benefit of having like a travel credit card? Yeah, certainly. There, there could be quite a few benefits. Yeah. Uh, and even for someone who just takes something like one trip a year, uh, they can be very beneficial for you. You know, I think it's important to get over the uh, the belief that, you know, I don't want to spend money on something like a credit card, right? You spend a hundred yeah. bucks. Okay, that's a hundred dollars gone. I could have spent that on whatever, on lunch, whatever. Uh, but really what it is in most cases is it's an investment. And if yeah. you're smart about it, then it can be a very good investment. You can double, triple, quadruple, or even do more with that money that you're investing there. So our ethos is to help people to, uh, to understand that and, and basically to do the 80, 20 for them. So they can just come to our site and see, okay, here's what I should do. You know, five minutes later, they're done. They don't have to think about this stuff. For but sure. to answer your question, you know, what are the benefits of a travel credit card? I mean, yeah, as you mentioned, you, you, you can get a lot of bonus points, which mm -hmm. uh, you can apply those points for flights and get significantly cheaper flights um, through North America or overseas, whatever. Yeah. Um, some of the cards, the more premium cards will come with lounge access. And I got to be honest with you, if you step foot into an airport lounge, yeah. you will not want to give up that benefit. <laughs> For sure. It, it is night and day from just sitting at the gate and eating terrible food from vending machines or from overpriced restaurants. Yeah, right? You yeah. go into the lounge, you're there, you're having your buffet food, you're having drinks, you take a shower sometimes. It is such a different experience and you will not want to go back. Yeah. So once you're hooked on these sort of things, then yeah, you're, you're hooked. That's awesome. Yeah, that's super cool. And that was definitely one of the things that stood out when I was reading um, through the Your Oyster stuff, especially back in the day, because I just had no idea about that sort of stream of travel, which is very interesting. Um, so what has Your Oyster become now? You said it's changed a little bit over the years. What's the real difference now in that site? Well, there, there's a big difference, actually. You know, in the beginning, it, we were running a service to help people get cheaper flights. And so the way it worked is that you would reach out to us and you'd say, hey, I'm going to Europe in August. I want to go to Berlin and London and Amsterdam, and I'm going for two weeks. And the best price I found was $900. Yeah. Like, we beat it. And then I would spend some time figuring out an itinerary, trying to beat that price. Sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. If it didn't work, then it meant that I just wasted an hour because I, you know, I, I obviously wouldn't charge someone if I can't help them. For sure. uh, and once you once you waste an hour enough times, uh, you know, you you start getting a little cynical and you think, of okay, this uh, this needs to change. This business model isn't scalable. So yeah. over time, I started doing it for businesses, which made a lot more sense. Very cool. uh, for, the prices of flights are something like in the order of 10 times more expensive, which means I can normally save them 10 times as much money. Uh, so that makes a lot more sense. Um, but even still, I, I, I wanted to pivot from that business and create something that would be able to touch more, uh, more people. And, sure. you know, we were already pretty deep into credit cards. Yep. So I thought, what if we just go broader into personal finance, right? Yeah. The, there's so much, you know, it's the same problem that um, there's an information asymmetry. There's so much good quality information out there, but it's hard to find and it's hard to understand for the average person, right? Sure. We, like I, I went to business school, I took finance classes. Yeah. Uh, I'm not so intimidated by most of this stuff, but, yeah. you know, thinking about someone, I, I think this is a great way to, to think about your your audience if you're building like a business or something. What would my mother do in this scenario, right? She's 60 years old. She knows a little bit about personal finance, but certainly not much. Uh, so how can I reach someone like her and give her a good recommendation for her specific scenario? So that's what we try to do. Uh, and at the stage that we're at right now, I say we, cause we've got a team of about 10 at this point. I love it, um, yeah. And you know, right now we're we're really deep in the credit card game, but we're also uh, branching out into bank accounts, into investment platforms, uh, these new types of investment vehicles called robo advisors, which help you to manage your money automatically. It's crazy, um, eh? Wow. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Anything that's going to help people make smart financial decisions with the minimum amount of effort. That's what we're all about. I love it. That's that's awesome. So so you guys have grown a lot from a solo guy to now a team. It's crazy. Congrats yeah, and actually, that. thank you. All that growth, it, it's funny, all that growth has occurred in the last six months. Six months wow. ago, it was still just me working on this, but I really kind of took a step back and thought, okay, how can we build this into something that's actually valuable instead of it being a bit of a side project for me? And so yeah. this seemed like the way forward. For sure. Awesome. So how much time do you spend on your oyster? Um, like, what's the breakdown of your life right now? Like, because we'll talk about your book in a second that you're going to be um, publishing. Um, but what's the breakdown of your life right now? Like, are you writing a lot? Like, are you working on the business a lot? Like, sort of, how's your how's your time? Yeah, my time is often split between the two. Okay. Um, at the moment, right now, it's it's almost exclusively on the business. Okay. Um, I have an, I actually have another website that I'm gearing up to sell pretty okay. shortly. So I'm putting some more time into that. Um, but yeah, pretty much I'm, you know, I'm in, I, I kind of separate my thinking into like creative, creative mode and business mode. And right now I'm, I would say 95% in business mode. Awesome. Uh, and I say right now because, you know, I finished writing my book two months ago. And I really just needed a break from that. I needed some time off to think and decompress, yeah. and just get some space. I think it's always good to have some perspective on your creative projects. And when you go so deep into them, yeah. you know, it took me about two and a half years to write this book. So I was very, very deep in it. Yeah, and yeah. I lost all my perspective, right? Uh, sure. I, <laughs> yeah. it, it's kind of funny, actually, how poor of a judge I was of my own work just by virtue of being so close to it. Wow. So yeah, at this point I'm, I took a couple months off from it and um, that's why I'm in business mode right now. I love it. That's great. Yeah. That's a great balance too. So like you finished your book and now you can focus on, you know, one thing, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, so let's move on to your book. What is it about? Why did you decide to write it? Let's break this down a little bit. So what, what is the book about? Sure. So the book is about problem solving. Okay. And I, I think, you know, in my other discussions with people, when you say you wrote a book about problem solving, uh, the first thing that jumps to mind is, oh, you know, great. I have some problems that I need to solve. Maybe I should read your book. Uh, and <laughs> the answer is maybe you should, but not necessarily for that reason. Okay. It's not a self-help book. It's not designed to help you solve problems. What it is, is it's an exploration of problems. Uh, it looks at a variety, actually five core different problems, and they're all completely different from each other, um, but five big issues. And it looks at, you know, gets a really deep understanding of what the issues are uh, sure. from a perspective that we probably haven't taken before. Um, okay. It looks deeper at, who are the people who are devoting their lives to solving this problem? And then brings, you know, it, it looks at it through at these problems through a variety of uh, sociological and cultural perspectives. Um, I mean, I, I can give you an example. There, uh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, let's. Uh, well, choose a number between one and five. There's five chapters. Okay. Um, number two. Number two. Okay. Number two is about airplane seats. And it's about the design of business and first class airplane seats, uh, which on its own is an extremely esoteric topic, right? Something sure. you wouldn't normally think about. Um, but I had the privilege of sitting down with some people who spend their literally their entire lives doing this. Uh, one gentleman named James Park, who is most people would agree the number one airplane seat designer in the world. He's okay. got a firm based in London. They have offices in Dubai and Singapore, and they design the seats for most of the major airlines. Uh, and so I sat down with James and, and picked his brain and asked him all these questions about seats. But really what that chapter is about is a comparison between James and another guy uh, who was who was basically a boy genius when he was working with British Airways. He 
got to the, uh, the executive suite incredibly quickly um, because he was just so, so good at his job. That's uh, awesome. He left British Airways in his mid thirties when he was basically at the top. He wasn't the CEO, but he was one level down from that. And he left to start his own airline. And then he starts an airline that people love. And okay. if you know anything about uh, customer reviews with airlines, uh, people don't like airlines very much, right? If you go on- It's very true, yeah. Or, <laughs> or any airline in the world, right? Even the ones you think are great, you know, you can choose any airline in Canada or wherever you are. Uh, you're gonna see terrible reviews. Of course, but this yeah. airline that this particular guy started, people loved. They were raving about it. Wow. Uh, and so the question is like, what happens with this airline? Well, you know, over time, over, over the course of a couple of years, the airline goes bankrupt. Wow. And the question is why? And my thesis is that they did everything right. You know, this guy was a boy genius. He was an incredible executive when it comes to airlines. He thought about everything. He was incredibly strategic, but he chose the wrong seat. And so what the chapter is about is getting an understanding of how do seats impact, you know, both airlines, but also the passengers who fly on them and why that's so important for the, for the in-flight experience. Um, and, you know, kind of the larger lesson there is what does it mean when you do 99% of things right, but you do the one important thing wrong? Well, it means that you fail. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I, I love that. Dude, I'm sold on the book. That, that's a great case study because it makes sense. Because if you make one mistake, it could be detrimental if it has a high weight on it. So that's very interesting. So I, I assume you look at the importance of like the variables of the seat and stuff like that, I assume. Like what makes a seat great? I, I don't know if you dive into that. Is, is that sort of the stuff that you go into? Yeah, there's certainly some some you know technical stuff in there. I, I spoke with a ton of engineers and people who build seats and you know, all that stuff. Yeah, so I've got yeah. all that knowledge. That's um, awesome. I guess more what it's about is, uh, is I guess one level up from those technical things, which is there's a, there's a measurement within aviation called load factor. Okay. And what load factor measures is out of how, you know, how, how full is the plane? That's what load factor means. So okay. if you've got 200 seats on a plane and 150 of them have bodies in them, then you're at a 75% load factor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know the, the load factor proves to be a very pivotal number, um, but also a bit of a mysterious one in this case. Interesting. Um, as, as you read, you'll find out. I, I should also cool. say, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm excited about it. I, I should mention though, you know, we've spent the, the first uh, 20 or so minutes here talking a lot about flights and airlines and things like that. Yeah. It was a total fluke that you chose chapter two, which is about <laughs> airplane seats. The other four chapters are not related to airplanes. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, chapter no. one is about birth control. Um, okay. Chapter five is about uh, something a bit darker, school shootings and suicide. Okay. Um, you know, three and four are about completely different things as well. Okay. So, very cool. Yeah. That's very cool. So each chapter breaks down a different situation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're completely cool. distinct, but there are, you know, as you go through it, you realize that these completely different problems from completely different geographies at completely different time periods, they do have some similarities. And so that's what the book is really about, those similarities. I love it. So I can see just based on the structure of your book, it's definitely people that are into things like Malcolm Gladwell, you know, probably Tim Ferriss, Seth Godin. That's definitely the same sort of great book that has case studies that really showcase stuff. Even like things like Ryan Holiday. That's it's great. Those are the types of books I read. So I will definitely read your book. That's that's awesome because I find in books like yours, you really highlight something that people never think about, like airplane seats. How can that actually affect the business? It's crazy. That's that's awesome. Mm. I love it. I love it. That's great. Um, yeah, I think so too. One, you know, the way that I've been thinking about it is what I what I say to myself is I'm trying to add depth and color for my reader. That's great. So, yeah. 
making the world deeper and more colorful for them so that when you look around, and I, I've seen this in myself through some of the reading that I've done and some of the writing I've done too, once you start to understand that things are much more complex than we believe they are, you know, you, for example, after reading this chapter, my hope is that you'll never see an airplane seat the same way. That's great. And maybe that will trickle over to the rest of your life. Maybe you'll never see a table or a chair or a plate the same way because you know that things have history and complexity and personality to them. I love it. And honestly, like from a personal note, when I read books, it's not just to obviously learn just random facts, but I find like when you read a really good book, it helps you look at the world a little bit different, helps you observe yeah. things a little bit different. And that's great. Like if that's the takeaway, especially from like a chapter about airplane seats, that's something that readers will always have with them and they can always refer back to, which is an incredible. Because I can't think of another book that's ever did a case study on airplane seats, which is totally original. I love it. That's great. Mm. Um, great. What was your inspiration for writing this book? What was the reason you decided to write a book? I guess when you're a writer, that's just kind of what you do, I mm -hmm. suppose. Um, I don't really know. I, I guess, you know, I wanted to do something larger than I was. I was writing for a magazine for a while about luxury travel. Yep. Uh, and, you know, I, I've consulted to some uh, some hospitality companies and some other companies in that, uh, like travel and those sort of spaces. Um, but, you know, that I guess, you know, right. It's just kind of all paths lead to a book, I would say, when you're a writer. It's just something you do. And sure. I... You know, I, I read, this is probably very important as well. I read a lot. Uh, I love the books that I read. I, uh, you know, they make me feel a particular way. They give me okay. a feeling that I call the glow. And the glow for me is when it, it's kind of a mix of insight and surprise and a couple other emotions, but particular writers give me the glow and I know it because I get goosebumps. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, you know, that that's one of the, basically one of the measuring sticks that I try to use in my writing is will I be able to give people the glow with this piece of writing? And if yes, then it's normally pretty good. And if no, then I'll normally rework it. Oh, okay, I love it. Um, what is the main difference from writing on like say a blog or a magazine compared to writing for a book, like your own book. What's the main difference, do you think? It's a big difference. The main difference is uh, planning. You need okay. to plan. And I wish that I really knew this when I started. Uh, uh, you know, I was accustomed to writing things that were a thousand words long. But when you write a book, which is normally 60 to 70,000 words, you really need to plan it and structure it in advance. And wow. that can be difficult if you don't know exactly where you're going. When I started yeah. this, I didn't know exactly where I was going. Uh, and it, it took quite a big turn. Um, twice, I would say. Once in the early stages and then once about six months from the end, maybe nine months from the end. Okay. So, yeah, I, I just hadn't planned my time well. So that, I would say, is probably the biggest difference. The second one is that you really, really need to love your topic because yeah. you could be sitting with this thing for, you know, in my case, two and a half years. So if you're not really into the topic, then you're going to burn out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you have to be really interested in doing all that research, I assume. And if you're doing interviews to sit down with somebody that, you know, that you're actually interested in. Definitely. Yeah. That's very interesting. Um, in terms of your writing process for the book, how did it sort of form? What was your steps? Like you were talking about like first planning, like where do you go from there in terms of brainstorming the cre the creative side? Hmm. Well, okay. So I, I didn't plan as I should have for this book. I really wish that I had from the get go. Mm -hmm. My process was more like, I just went after the things that I found interesting. So I came across, you know, in the case of the airplane seats, I came across, 
uh, some people who were designing airplane seats. And I thought, that's an interesting problem. Let me read a little bit about that. Let me do some research. Let me talk to some people. And from there, this story formed out of it. Oh, okay. I think in my particular case, and I feel like a lot of writers are this way, you just come across little nuggets of ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, they generally come out of reading. Um, I'll read something that's just a sentence thrown into someone else's piece. And I think, well, that's that's pretty interesting on its own. I got to read a little bit more about that. And yeah. then you go down the rabbit hole. Or sometimes they come from conversations. I think it's really important to surround yourself with a diverse group of people, uh, of friends, of yeah. who are you know, who just feed you ideas, not because they're trying to feed you ideas, but because that's just who they are. They're constantly learning about new things and, you know, you're having different sorts of conversations. And out of that, you get this incredible shelf of ideas in your mind that you can just pull from at any given point. Mm -hmm. um, I've also got a, you know, I, I keep a long list of these things as well. So I've got a list in, uh, you know, online here that I can just go to at any point and, it's it's basically things that I'm interested to write about that I haven't researched yet. Okay. Cool. And you know I'm adding to that list all the time, so I, I'm at no shortage of the ideas there. That's in great. terms of in terms of structuring things, so once you have a bit of a plan, yeah, I would say just follow those uh, those ideas that interest you, um, and do it every day. That's, mm -hmm. that's a really important thing. It sounds kind of cliche or like it, it wouldn't be that important, but I think it's incredibly important to stick with your craft every single day. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I'll take a Sunday off here and there because I'm really burnt out. For but sure. otherwise, you know, if, if you really want to make your craft your career, then you need to take it, you, you need to treat it as a profession. You need to be a professional about it. And that means doing it on the days that you don't want to do it, right? I love it. I think one thing that there's this notion with creatives that creatives get inspired and that, you know, you as a writer, you do it by, I don't know, you do it by the beach or you do it on like a, you know, a little notebook while you're sitting in a busy cafe in Paris and stuff. And like, maybe sure you can do that once or twice, but if you're a professional, you do it every day, like yeah. in the same spot, you eat the same foods and you have your routine. And that's what writing looks like. It doesn't look like you in a cafe in Paris. It looks like you on your computer for six hours, for sure. just sh kind of struggling and pushing through it. Grinding it out for sure. Yeah, no, and And I think that's definitely a big thing with, creative fields is it's day in and day out it's not sporadic it's day in and day out if you want to improve exactly which is great and it's funny when you were talking about like sort of the routine the daily routine and kind of getting obsessed with like a specific topic or like writing about something i had on a uh he's a professional illustrator so he does like work for wall street journal all those big publications and he was talking about how he is currently obsessed with drawing a specific part of the body. I don't remember the name of it, but it's attached to the collarbone. And that's literally all he does right now. It's just keeps drawing that same thing all the time because he's trying to master it. And it's just, as a creative, you just like go, it's just like, wow, that sounds insane, but it makes sense because you're trying to improve mm. day in and day out, which is very interesting. I love it though. That that's that's great. Um, when it comes to brainstorming, do you usually just jot down ideas? I know you're saying that you have a list that you just keep adding to. Do you ever sit down and say, "I'm going to make ten ideas a day"? Because I know some people do that. Like, do you ever do that sort of thing? That's <laughs> just like very structured. I don't know. <laughs> that that's hilarious because I do exactly that. Perfect. Cool. I, I, I do that every single morning. I write down ten ideas. Um, and I, you know, it, it's about anything. It's not about writing. It's not about my business. Sometimes they are, but often they're just completely different things. I love that. Uh, and then I, I try to send those ideas to people who will value them. So sometimes, I mean, here, here's a really good example, actually. I was in Spain last week. Uh, okay. Some friends and I decided to go to Spain for a month. 
um, because it was cold. They were in Berlin, <laughs> I was in Istanbul, and we just said, let's go to Spain for a month and it'll be warmer. So we went there and we were on my friend's rooftop and we were talking about his business. He runs a really interesting travel deals business based out of Berlin. It's one of the okay. biggest in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. And we decided let's, like he, he kind of told me about a couple of uh, difficulties that he was having. And I said, okay, you know, tomorrow when I do my 10 ideas, which is kind of the second part of my, my morning, um, I'm going to think about this for you. And so I did, and I wrote down 10 ideas. And then that afternoon, we talked about them on his rooftop again. And we, you know, we spent probably an hour just brainstorming these things, adding on to them, seeing how they're actually relevant for his business. And less than a week later, he sent me a message that said, you know, a lot of it was about uh, PR and marketing, how to get more press, how to get media yeah, attention. Yeah. He sent me a message actually just two days ago uh, with a link from a huge feature on his company that had been written and just published that day. And he said, there's no way I would have made this happen if it wasn't for that discussion that we had. And That's all that so came cool. from those ideas that morning. Very so cool. yeah, it's so funny that you bring that up. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited about this and we haven't ever talked about this. So yeah, it's yeah. a coincidence, but you know, it, it, it is so important, I think, to, to build that muscle and to continue practicing that and getting better at it, right? That sure. You need to practice ideas just in the same way you need to practice, you know, your sport or your craft or whatever. For sure. No, I, I love it. That's great. I I need to start getting back into the 10 ideas a day. I used to do that all the time, to be honest. Um, now I'm kind of sporadic, uh, but I like, to, I like to keep a structure. So in terms of structure of your life, I know you have... You know, you do a lot of writing, you do um, obviously your business now. Um, what is your routine like on like a daily basis? Like what are your sort of habits? Yeah, I'm certainly a creature of habit. I, so, I mean, to, to be, tell me if this is going too granular, but when I wake up, uh, I make my bed first thing, which I think is really important to, yep. to start things clean and, you know, just have some order going into the day. Um, sure. I have a, I have a 47 minute meditation routine that I do, which sounds a little bit, um, long and, and maybe difficult, but yeah. it's pretty powerful for me. It works for me. Um, and some, you know, I've experimented with different, different types of meditation and things like for this, sure. but this one just works. Uh, the key to this is, I would say, I think the most important part of it is envisioning and not just envisioning, but stepping into the future that I want. So mm -hmm. I, get, I get extremely specific on, on the things that I want in my future. And I feel the feelings that are associated with those things. So, you know, in the morning, I'm feeling generosity. I'm feeling abundance. I'm feeling freedom. I'm feeling, uh, you know, just lightness, levity. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I, I'm really embodying those feelings. And then I'm feeling gratitude for all of that. And I, so I do that for a while in the morning. After that point is, you know, my mind is very clear and I just feel like a million bucks. And then I do the 10 ideas. Uh, and normally, you know, normally throughout the day, you know, at random points throughout the day, I'll just think of something, oh, you know, here's a problem I, I kind of want to think about, or here's an opportunity for someone else that maybe I can help them with. For sure. And I put that in my list, my list of, ideas to get ideas about, if that makes sense. For sure. So yeah, in the morning, I just look at that list and I say, okay, I'll do that one, get my 10 ideas. Maybe I send them to the, the person if it'll help them or do something with them, or I just keep them there on my list. It doesn't matter. Um, and from that point, that's when I get into my work. Mm -hmm. And if I'm writing, then I normally write for between four to eight hours in a day. And I really had to work up to that number. I used to only be able to write for maybe two hours or three hours on a good day. Mm -hmm. But over time, as I've been doing it, um, it's become, you know, I, I've built up a bigger tolerance. And I guess for I've sure. been building that, that muscle. So yeah. I'll do that. Or if I'm doing business stuff, then I'll do that for however many hours. And then finally, when it comes to the afternoon, I take... 
a nice break, um, sure. which a break for me normally means reading. Uh, and then in the evening, I'll see my friends. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Um, I have a couple questions about the routine. So mm -hmm. the first one is in terms of that writing block, are you just writing one particular piece? Are you doing like multiple things like brainstorming throughout it? Like what's that sort of look like? Yeah, when it's writing, I am working on one thing. Okay. When, when it's, you know, this business stuff, I have a tendency to be a little bit more sporadic. And as a result of that, I'm probably less effective. But when it's writing, you know, I'm, I'm working on the book and I'm working on one section of one chapter within the book. Okay. So you're focused on one thing, just not multitasking all over the place. No, I can't handle multitasking. Yeah, I, I, and I think especially for something like in a creative field, you can't multi multitask because you just get, you, you're just not moving forward. You're just too far all over the place. It's, it's crazy sometimes. So I think that's exactly. great. Uh, I think that's a great thing. Um, and then you also mentioned reading. So I have a quick question. Um, what book are you reading right now, if you're reading anything? Hmm. I'm actually rereading a book that I just read a couple weeks ago right now. I, like I said, I read a lot. So some, you know, sometimes it'll be a couple books a week. Uh, awesome. but right now I'm, I'm rereading choose yourself by James Altucher. That's a great book. Yeah. 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 He's a, that, that's a great book. It, it's, I think, you know, it, it's written in a really, of an extremely accessible and vulnerable way. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's got some extremely powerful mindset stuff in there. Uh, it sure. also talks about those 10 ideas a day. This is where I got the idea for that from this author, James Altucher. And he, he's a fascinating, fascinating guy yeah. that I'm, I've known about him for years, but I'm only really kind of giving him some of my time and attention now. And I'm very, very uh, grateful for what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a very interesting guy. Um, and then now, like, he's doing stand-up comedy too, like, just to mm -hmm. expand his creativity. Like, he's a very interesting guy. He's always doing something. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very cool. Um, do you have any book recommendations? So on this podcast, we always do like a book of the week. Um, so do you have any book recommendations? It could be something that changed your life over the years, sort of anything that people may be interested in. Definitely. Well, I think maybe I'm going to give two because I feel like one of them is very well known and one sure. of them is not. Um, the first one, which I think will resonate with your audience, I, I get the feeling that, uh, you know, I mean, it's not only your audience, but a lot of us are looking for more freedom and more yeah. control over our lives and things like this. So the book that that is the you know the Bible of that, in my opinion, is the Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. I love it's it. A, it's a classic. It completely turned my life on its head when I read it in 2011 or 2012. Actually, uh, I was living in New York at that time and really did not like my life situation. I was on an internship. I was okay. in a tough time, and the book just totally changed everything for me. So. That's always got a special place in my heart. I, um, I feel like most people have heard of that one though and have maybe been recommended it before because it is so good. For so sure, another, yeah. another author that I want to surface, uh, you already mentioned an author that I, that I admire infinitely, which is Malcolm Gladwell. But there's another one who also writes for the New Yorker magazine, just like Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. By the way, I think if you want to be a good writer, you should read the New Yorker and don't read much else. Okay. Um, I, I, if, yeah, that's, that's kind of my one, like, I feel pretty strongly about that. There's just so much there and all the writers have books themselves. So you can go infinitely deep there. But one of those writers, it. surgeon, he's a surgeon from Boston. Uh, he does a lot of work with the world health organization and his name is Atul Gawande. He's okay. written, I think he's written five books. Uh, if he's written more then I'm excited because I want more of his stuff. I've read his five of his books. Um, and they're about, they're generally about medicine, but from a very accessible perspective. And it's more so how medicine and everyday life overlaps. 
So yeah. because he's a surgeon, he's drawing, you know, lessons and research and all of that from medicine, but it's not at all a medical text, right? You okay. can know nothing about medicine or the human body and you can just totally get into this stuff. I love so it. I would say one of his books, maybe the one that I like the most is called Better. Okay. And it's about how to be better. I love it. I love it. That's that's very. I've never heard of him before. That's that's a very interesting book. Um, that's that's great. And I love people that have different perspectives about the world, and their ideas are accessible through their through their writing, which I love it. I love it. It gives you a different perspective. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and four hour work week is one of my favorites of all time. It's a it's a classic. Yeah, <laughs> it's a classic. He's 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 great. Um, in terms of your, say, idols or writing role models, do you have anybody that you look up to for um, whether it's inspiration or just following their content or for guidance? Yeah, actually, I just mentioned the two of them. Okay, <laughs> Those are Gladwell and Atul Gawande. So I like, to, I like to try and understand how the writer writes something when I read it. Okay. Um, and it's the reason that I don't listen to any audiobooks, even though I know I'd be able to listen to more and probably learn more, but it's really important to me to get in touch with the words that they use and the way that they present ideas. And I think yeah. that you don't get that in an audio book, or at least you can't go over it and, and chew on it for a minute and think about, you know, the, what happens after the semicolon and all that sort of stuff. Sure. So I, I, I've read their books, uh, you know, at least once, some of them multiple times, some of them many times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and all of their magazine pieces. And I'm just trying to understand, you know, and the reason I, I read there so much is that I, they give me the glow, right? I talked about the I glow a few yep. ago. And I totally get it from these guys uh, and from other people too. And so whenever someone gives me the glow, I just go really deep on their stuff. And I'll read everything they've written for the last 10 years and try to figure out how are they doing this? How are they giving me this, not only this emotional sensation, but this literally physiological sensation? I have goosebumps from a person who wrote this 10 years ago. That's an incredibly powerful tool. And I want to be able to do that for my readers too. For sure. And, and that's fantastic because you want people, if you have like books or content out there, to do a deep dive on you because they're so interested in your content or, you know, literature which is fantastic. I love it. Um, in terms of the book that you're writing, do you know when it's going to be coming out? It should be out around May of this year, May 2020. Awesome. Awesome. Do you know where people can get it yet? Or are you going to announce that stuff when it's closed? Yeah, it'll, be, it'll be available on Amazon for sure. Perfect. Do you have a name for it? Yeah. That you want no. to announce? If not, it's all good. No, I, I don't have the name. The name is generally the last thing that a, an author will choose. And mine is still going through the editing process. Okay. Um, and yeah, so it's not quite done at this point. And so I'm still kind of sitting on a couple of names. Uh, I don't want to give one in case that's not what I choose. Yeah, and then yeah for it sure. Listeners. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Uh, in terms of your life, you travel all over the world. You sort of done a lot in terms of visiting countries some would say i guess in the tim ferris light vagabonding um where have you been like wh what are the best places that you've been i know you sort of do long-term travel i i guess that's what it'd be called um tell me a little bit about that yeah certainly so i was i was traveling for four years and i don't consider the last two years traveling because now I live in Istanbul. I love um, but for those four years, I went a lot of places. I spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So I lived in three different places in Thailand, for example, lived in Vietnam, in Hong Kong. And when I say live, you know, take it with a grain of salt. I mean, for two, three, four months, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, in all those places, uh, I was in South America for four months and spent some spent a lot of time in Argentina and Colombia specifically. 
Um, I've been to South Africa a number of times, uh, you know, all over Europe and living in Germany and uh, lots and lots of places. You asked about the best places or the places yeah. I like the most. Yeah. And I, you know, it's obviously this is a highly subjective question, but of the course, places yeah. that I like, I, I really like Asia. Uh, the cities there are so vibrant and exciting. Mm -hmm. They're so happening all the time. Uh, you know, people call New York the city that never sleeps. Yeah. But those people have clearly never been to Asia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a different world. Uh, they're incredibly dense. And they're incredibly also, something you might not expect, very technologically advanced. Um, I'm not just talking about smartphones and mm -hmm. stuff like that or neon lights. I'm talking about how how services are integrated into the city. And I think it's really interesting, you know, if you dive into any research about this, there's, uh, you know, you come across this idea that because some of these countries were relatively low income in the time frame of like 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, something like that, yeah. um, they didn't have the technology that we did at that time. Uh, one of the big ones that stands out is like telephone networks. So a lot of these countries have never had landlines. Yeah. What that means is that, you know, we we like to complain about the cost of uh, cell phone plans in Canada. And the reason for that is because we're still supporting these incredibly old, decrepit, uh, you know, telephone lines that we don't need anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah sure. But these other countries have never had those. They don't have to support that. You know, they don't have this uh, like this dead weight that they're that's holding them back. So they're just straight into the wireless age yeah. and they're doing it in a much better way than we are. Um, so that's pretty exciting. It really sets the stage for a very exciting uh, next decade or a couple of decades in those places. And I'm looking forward to spending a lot more time over there to be a part of that. I love it. Yeah, that, that sounds great. I've never been to Asia. I've Never really traveled the world, but I'm starting to finally get out there, which is nice because I now have some time that I can take off and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I hear it's great. And it's very interesting that you mentioned the technology aspect, which a lot of people I think forget about, um, especially when it comes to like, I know countries in Africa, uh, they talk about like the technological leapfrogging because they never had the landline. So they just go straight to the cell phones and then they have better cell phones. And I know some countries right now, um, I don't know if it's South Africa, but some of them are now on BlackBerry and that's like their number one phone. And that's like BlackBerry's biggest market, which is crazy. Um, so they're innovating for those specific countries. It's, I don't know, it's very interesting. I find uh, the whole globalization thing and then just technology in general around the world is just, it's a very interesting thing, very interesting topic. It certainly is. For anyone else who's interested in it, you really just need to follow where China is, has his hands in anything, right? China oh, yeah. is making, I'm sure you know this, huge investments in Africa, both because of things like rare earth metals, but also they're building entire internet infrastructures over there. Yeah. And on one hand, you could see it as helping Africa to, and you know, I, I shouldn't use Africa, like paint it with a broad brush here, but yeah, yeah. I don't know specific countries. I think we're mm -hmm. talking about sub-Saharan Africa, sure. um, helping them uh, kind of like a hand up. Yeah. Uh, but of course, other people think about things a little more cynically or, or with a few more, uh, uh, with more skepticism. So either way, it's an interesting thing to keep an eye on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's, uh, it's very interesting, especially like China, like they just, when it comes to technology, they just, they can do anything it's crazy it's like their advancements are just insane compared to you know a lot of north american um places and and even companies it's crazy they're just so far advanced um so it's just very interesting i love it uh why did you choose uh turkey as your place of residence why turkey well it's just a really interesting place here uh i think first of all it's worth noting that the the general understanding of Turkey is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Istanbul, for example, is a very safe place. It's a nice place to live. My lifestyle here is pretty fantastic. Uh, that's mm -hmm. why I say, uh, yeah, that, you know, it's just another case of the, the general perception of a place 
being completely wrong. Um, For sure. Had a, I've had quite a few friends who have come to visit from Toronto or from other places around the world. And a lot of them are a little bit um, hesitant before they come. But then yeah. once they're here, they say, wow, I got to come back. I want to stay longer. Yeah, I want to yeah. move there, things like that. Um, so as for me personally, uh, I, I don't have an excellent answer for why I moved here. I I was, like I said, traveling for four years. I was moving around every, about two months on average. Mm -hmm. And I just got tired. I got exhausted of moving, of uprooting my home, of changing my group of friends, you know, all the stuff that goes with it. I wasn't yeah. focusing on the projects that I wanted to work on. You know, I was getting by for sure, but I wasn't writing the book that I said I was writing and I wasn't really building any sort of business. Yeah. So I didn't have a lot of structure and I really wanted some structure. So I said, I'm going to move somewhere. And I had been here twice before then. Okay. And, you know, I, I had a couple of friends here. I knew a little bit about the city and I thought, let's just try it here. I'm willing to make an investment and give it a shot and see what happens. I love it. Yeah, that, that's a great approach. And it's very interesting because you know, you don't really hear about Turkey a lot, especially when it comes to like people visiting Europe and stuff like that. They kind of get, um, they kind of get missed, but just based on like pictures and stuff that you see, it's just, a, it looks like a beautiful place. It is. It really is. It, it's, you know, the landscapes here are a lot like Greece if we're talking about islands and beaches, mm -hmm. um, but there's so much more than that as well. Yeah. That's that's very cool. I am kind of jealous because it's super cold here right now, and uh, it's probably gonna start snowing soon. <laughs> How, well, how's the how's the weather in Turkey? By the I way? mean, I, I was walking around in shorts yesterday. Oh my gosh! So I'm bad. granted, I I'm the only one doing that because I'm the lonely, warm Canadian here. But uh, You're the solo uh, Canuck. <laughs> it's still pretty nice. I think at this time. Uh, it's, you know, something like 12 degrees, maybe even 15 degrees when I think for you, it's gotta be below zero. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a, it's been a chilly one the last few days for sure. It's been chilly, <laughs> but, um, it's all good. Um, one other thing that we do on this podcast is an app of the week. So just an app recommendation. Um, in the past people have recommended like travel apps. People have recommended like photography apps, you know? finance apps like budgeting apps do you have an app an app recommendation that somebody can use in their life yeah i'll give another one that i don't think people have you know i i'd be surprised if someone else mentioned this on the podcast sure. yeah. it is pocket do you know pocket okay. yes i love pocket but i have never me mentioned too. it i don't think yeah me too i think pocket is other than maybe WhatsApp, Pocket is the app on my phone that gets used the most. I for, for anyone who doesn't know, Pocket allows you to save web content offline. Mm -hmm. So if you like a piece from the New York Times or from if you're reading other, <laughs> if, yeah. if you have different tastes and you read BuzzFeed, then you can save something <laughs> there. Uh, you know, you can save whatever you want offline and you can read it on your phone in a really nice format and you can just save it there. So I've got hundreds, actually thousands of things offline and it's really easy to find them and I can read them and reread them and Pocket is just amazing. And yeah, if anyone likes to read, then you should definitely get Pocket. You should go to the newyorker.com and you should just read everything on there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I love it, I love it. Um, yeah, no, that's a fantastic app and it's multi-platform, which is crucial in today's world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Um, okay. Um, we're coming to the end of the podcast, but I just have a couple more questions. Uh, do you have any hobbies outside of, say, writing and entrepreneurship, stuff like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, those are, I would say, definitely my biggest hobbies uh, because they're really exciting to me. I, For sure. I would say probably my biggest hobby outside of my actual work stuff, yeah. which is like writing and the business, is yeah. actually thinking of other businesses and kind of theorizing them and, you know, maybe testing them or something like that. I just, that's really, really fun for me. I love it. Uh, but the other things that I do, you know, I said I read a lot, which mm. I really do read a lot, probably more than anyone I know, which 
has just been always something I've enjoyed. That's um, great. I like to I like to go for walks actually and just kind of think about stuff. I don't I don't really is that a hobby or is that just kind of No, I I would think that yeah, that's definitely a hobby because yeah. you have it part of your life. That's something you do. Yeah, definitely. So I, I do that quite a lot whenever I'm uh, I don't know if I'm stuck on something or whatever, you know, I just go for a walk. Uh, some I, I run sometimes. I used to run a lot, but not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and other than that, I'm just spending time with my friends here. I, I'm I've got a growing group of friends. You know, I've been here less than two years, so it took a little while for me to find my footing. Yeah, uh, and really find those friends that, uh, you know, I I think it's easy to find friends that you can just hang out with and have a laugh with. Those yeah. are easy to find, but in terms of the friends that you actually like really see as being a part of your future. Mm -hmm. That takes a little longer when you move somewhere new. So I've been finding those people and I've been in. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jordan. Hey, Jordan, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I lost you there for a second. Yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good. We're back. We're still on. Um, sorry. So let's restart this little segment. I'll crop all this stuff out. Um, you can hear me though, right? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. So, so what I want to know is in terms of, I think we're talking about friends. Um, <laughs> I forget my question. Oh, hobbies. And setting up friends. So if you can con continue talking about um, friends, that'd be great. And then we can uh, crop it in. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, it, you know, it takes a little bit of time when you move to a new place. And I just moved here about a year and a half or two years ago. For sure. So it, it takes some time to develop your, what I would call your inner circle. Yeah. I think it's easy to find people who you can spend a Friday night with and have a laugh and, you know, enjoy yourself. But in terms of finding the people who are really your inner circle, the people that you see as a part of your future, that takes a little bit longer. So yeah. I've been, you know, over the last 18 or 24 months here, I've been really spending a lot of time finding those people, investing in those people, spending time with those people. And that's probably my, my biggest hobby right now. I love it. I love it. Um, and that's great that you talk about that because, you know, like a lot of people in your life may be just, you know, people that you just hang out with, just good times and stuff like that. But people that you actually have similar interests to in terms of work is a totally different thing too, which is very interesting. Yeah. Um, I love it. Okay. Um, I think that's it for today's podcast. We've went through, we've gone through a lot. It's been great. Um, so before we sort of wrap it up, is there anything that you want to promote? Where can people find you? All that sort of good stuff. Oh, that <laughs> this might be a <laughs> question, actually. Okay. I I mean, yeah, I think if if people are interested in in the discussion we had about my book, then they can definitely check that out. Sure. Uh, because it's untitled right now, they should. If you're listening to this, you can set a set a calendar reminder in your phone for okay. six months from now or something like June or July okay. uh, of 2020 and just look up my name Jordan Bishop and you should find my book uh, other than that I don't do social media so don't bother following me there okay uh, you can also check out our website if you're a Canadian that is interested in uh, you know getting better at personal finance then you can definitely check out our website at youroyster.com that's y-o-r-e oyster.com and that's about it. Awesome. So find you on the website and then set a reminder to check back. Yep. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, perfect. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, at the end of every episode, what we do is a question of the day. So this is a question that you can ask the audience so they can ponder it throughout the week um, and really think about their life. It can be deep. It can be surface level. It can be whatever you want. So now's your your chance to ask the question. Hmm. 
Okay, putting me on the spot. <laughs> I think this is a question I've been asking myself lately, so I think it's relevant, which is what are the feelings that you want to feel in your future? I love it. I love it. So what are your feelings that you want to feel in the future? Mm -hmm. If you can get crystal it. clear on those feelings, then I think that answer alone gives you a lot of guidance over what you should do. If you're thinking about, should I do A or B or none of the above? Often the answer to that question will help, will not help, but it will give you the answer to what you're thinking about. So that's what I would encourage people to ask themselves. I love it. That's a deep one. It's perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Jordan. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. It was great to catch up. Um, and we will do this again soon in the future. Yeah, and my I look pleasure. forward to your book. Me too. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Canadian cream.